After watching this video, you should be able to recall the values of the important cardiovascular pressures. Let's first take a look at the atria. We have the right atrium and the left atrium, and it's important to recognize that throughout the cardiac cycle, the atria have a relatively low pressure. They're a low pressure system. The great arteries, the pulmonary artery and aorta throughout the cardiac cycle, maintain a relatively high pressure. So they're a high pressure system. And the ventricles, the right and left, they have to achieve a high pressure as well as quite a low pressure in the cardiac cycle. So the ventricles are very dynamic in the pressures they achieve throughout the cardiac cycle. Now, it's also important to recognize that the right side, the right atrium, right ventricle, and pulmonary artery has generally a lower pressure than the left side, the left atrium, left ventricle, and aorta. And that has important considerations that we'll discuss later. Now, for the atria, we have important waveforms, the A wave, the V wave, and we also can calculate the mean pressure. And the, the ventricles, there's the peak systolic pressure and the end diastolic pressure. We have the, the great arteries, we have the peak systolic and diastolic pressures, as well as the average pressure. We also can look at the difference between the peak systolic and, and the minimum pressure, the diastolic, and that's called the pulse pressure. So those are most of the important pressures that you need to think about. There's a couple of other ones that we'll look at in just a second. Now remember the, for the Wiggers diagram, and this is just looking at the left side, but all the principles apply to the right. For the atria, we have the A wave, which corresponds to atrial contraction, which has to occur just after the atrial depolarization, which we can see with the P wave there. We have the C wave, which is going to coincide with the AV valve closure, and that happens after the ventricles contract, which is triggered by ventricular depolarization, which we see here is the QRS complex. The X descent, the drop in pressure after the C wave, and then the pressure rises slowly as the, the atria fill from the ventricles, and then it hits a peak at the V wave where the AV valves open. And then, after the V wave, there is a drop in atrial pressure called the Y descent as the atria is delivering blood to the ventricles in an early rapid filling phase. So those are the important atrial pressures that we can look at. Now we also have the ventricle pressures here, and we can see that the peak pressure in the ventricle is called the peak systolic pressure. There's also the end systolic pressure where the semilunar valves close. We also have end diastolic pressure. This is the pressure where the AV valves close and that pressure starts to rise after the ventricle contracts. You can see that's where the IVC phase is. Now we have the minimum pressure in the great artery. It's called the diastolic pressure. That's where the semilunar valves open. And then the peak pressure in the great artery, it's called the peak systolic pressure. And that's achieved at the peak of ejection, just like the peak systolic pressure for the ventricle. And notice that these pressures are very similar. There's not much of a difference in, in terms of millimeters of mercury, assuming there's no obstruction of the semilunar valve. Now, I also want to point out that the ventricle pressure starts to relax just after the T wave somewhere. It's not always going to be the peak of the T wave, but I just want to point out that the T wave begins before that pressure drops. Now we have a cartoon of the anatomy. We have the right atrium here, which is getting blood from the superior and inferior vena cava, and there's the left atrium. We can see the pressures, the average pressures are right there. And as you can see, the average pressures are low, like we said earlier, it's a low pressure system. And the left atrium is a little bit higher than the right atrium. The right ventricle, we can see the peak pressure is right there, 15 to 30, and the end diastolic pressure is 2 to 8. And notice in the pulmonary artery that the peak pressure is very similar. Remember, the peak pressures are very similar between the great arteries and the ventricles. And then we can see that the minimum pressure in the great artery, in this case the pulmonary artery, is 4 to 12. Now we also can consider the left side. We have the pulmonary veins filling the left atrium. There's the average pressure again, 2 to 10, which is quite low. The left ventricle is much higher. 100 to 140 approximately is the peak pressure. The end diastolic pressure, that pressure where the AV valves close is 3 to 12. And then for the aorta, you see the peak pressure again is very similar to the peak left ventricle pressure. And that diastolic pressure, that minimum pressure in the aorta is, is quite high, 60 to 90. Remember, the, the great arteries maintain a high pressure.
The reason why it's important to recognize these pressures and understand that in general the left side pressures are greater than the right side pressures is that there happens to be a hole in the interventricular septum, blood's going to go from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. Or if there's a defect in the intraatrial septum, there could be flow going from the left atrium to the right atrium. And even if there's an abnormal connection maintained between the aorta and pulmonary artery, it's called the patent ductus arteriosus, Blood's going to continuously go from the aorta to the pulmonary artery because you can see those pressures in the aorta are always going to be higher than the pulmonary artery throughout the entire cardiac cycle. And in fact, that murmur is called a continuous murmur because of that continuous pressure gradient and continuous flow. And that concludes this video on important cardiovascular pressure values.